Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The haves and the have-nots. I think there used to be a television show on with that name, but believe me, they didn't, I didn't steal the name from them. They stole it from me. What we have in our text is a classic case of the haves and the have-nots. One, there was a rich man. Two, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. Jesus obviously is telling a story about the rich man and Lazarus to talk about the haves and the have-nots. But who are the real haves in this world and the ones Jesus is talking about, who are the have-nots? In the gospel lesson for today, we heard about the, the rich young man who came to Jesus. He obviously thought he was a have but he actually was a have-not. Could it be that Jesus wants to teach about being rich or poor? The playing field was hardly level for the two men, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. One was clothed in fine linen. He feasted sumptuously, extravagantly every day. The other had friends carry him to the gate in front of the yard of the rich man and he was there in hopes that he might be able to live off of some of the crumbs from the rich man's table. We have approximately 1.3 million Lutheran brothers and sisters in the South Pacific Island country of Papua New Guinea. Just think about that. One of their favorite New Testament stories is the Canaanite woman who begged Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus chided her, saying it was not right to take the bread from the table and throw it to the dogs. But she showed her great faith in Jesus when she replied, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. The people in Papua New Guinea consider themselves very poor compared to the people from, say, Australia or the countries in Europe or America. They could, in this world, be considered the have-nots. We look at ourselves and we see how much more we have materially. Whatever we feel the economy is doing this quarter, which we won't get into that, it's not doing very well, but we have to be honest and say that our country and most people in it have been richly blessed financially, comfort-wise, and I would say tech-wise as well. And I'm not so sure that that's such a blessing, but we'll talk about that sometime if you want to with me. It's funny, though, how can we so easily look around us across the street and across town and see our neighbors, maybe see the Joneses, and we think that they're the haves, right, and that we're the have-nots. Never mind that we have a house and three meals a day and some of them we can even eat out at the restaurant because we can afford to do that when we choose. We have nice things to wear. In fact, we dress down sometimes for church nowadays rather than to look too stuffy. Benjamin Franklin said, Who is wise? He that learns from everyone. He said, Who is powerful? He that governs his passions. And who is rich? He said, he that is content with what he has. And who is that? Absolutely nobody. Somehow we manage to see the rich man in our text as the other guy, not really ourselves. And yet, even getting that, we are indeed economic halves and isn't getting the point That's not the point of this text. That's really not the point. The rich young man, that's not the point. Jesus is not talking about being rich or being poor financially. That's not what he's talking about. There's much more to these stories of the haves and the have-nots. Perhaps there are some clues for the answer to the question, who are the haves and who are the have-nots? We know from a few verses before the text that Jesus was speaking directly to people whom he described as trying to justify themselves in the sight of people. You know, those old familiar Pharisees and Sadducees. They certainly considered themselves to be haves. They thought they had it all together. And Jesus knew that inside themselves, they thought they didn't need any forgiveness. There are a lot of people out there today, so people who call themselves Christians, that do not believe that they sin every day. Did you know that? 
That's very true today. Thus Jesus tells a story about one like them standing in the temple and saying, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, right, adulterers. But hear what God says in his word about that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And he says the truth is not in us. Your place in the house of God is standing alongside the one who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You will hear God saying to you, this man went down to his house justified. And you hear God's servant, your pastor, saying to you, I forgive you all your sins. You know, that's why I change up the confession every so often. Because you know what I've noticed over the years? If you do the confession out of the hymnal, nothing wrong with the confession out of the hymnal, trust me. But if you do it every Sunday, you know what I see? I see people looking out into space and they say the words because they've got them memorized. And I really don't think they realize that they're confessing their sins and that through their pastor, God is absolving them of all their sins because it just becomes a practice, right? And I just don't want to see that happen. So every so often, I'm going to surprise you and throw something different in there because I want you to think about the words that you're saying. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. That's what's important. However, Jesus is not even talking so much about the Pharisees and their sinful thinking because that, that was the way they were all the time. There is still so much more to the story of the haves and have-nots. Just before our text, Jesus reminded them the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Here's what constitutes real having or not having. I believe that today it is so much harder, especially for young people, to see the truth of the gospel message and to be the haves. Because through peer pressure, they see and they are taught that they are the have-nots. Let me share with you just three scripture texts here. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, from Matthew chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, Psalm 19 verse 1. You know, if there's one thing that I could desire for young people today, it would be that they could grow up as I did. To grow up working hard basically for everything that you got. Because your parents wanted you to respect it and the belongings of other people. To take care of your belongings and respect others' property as well. We were, that was pounded into us as kids. Everybody needs to go out and pick stones on a 105 degree day. Because you know what? If nothing teaches you humility, that will. To battle weeds in the crops. To have chores to do on the farm where you know if you don't feed those calves, they're going to die. They will die. And of course, if that happens, dad's going to ask questions about what's happened. To plant dead seeds and watch them sprout and grow. To stand in awe at how a hen lays an egg or how a cow takes all that corn and hay and, and all the things, you know, the, the minerals and, you know, the supplement that you give to them and turns it into milk. Man, we have an awesome God. To see trees bud in spring and drop their leaves, their acorns and their beech nuts and chestnuts in the fall, and watch deer and squirrels feed on them so we can feed on the deer and the squirrels. To pick berries 
I know my wife did a lot of this when she was young. She picked berries on her hands and knees. And peas and beans and dig your own potatoes and carrots and rutabaggies to help can and freeze. I loved helping my mom do that, knowing all the time that God provided the bounty for our next winter. 600 quarts worth we used to put up at our house. You know, four kids, and man, I could eat in those days. I could do a lot of work in those days, too. To realize through hard work that nothing of this world lasts. Nothing of this world lasts. It rots, it rusts, it goes back to the earth to provide new life. And get it. And to pray for rain and not get it. And then see God provide in some other way. And then and only then you begin to realize that God is in control. Not you, not your neighbor, but God. When I would get discouraged, man, I can, my dad, I can see his face and I will be able to see it until the day I go to heaven. And he would say a few things to me. He would just ask me some questions like what Jesus used to do with the Pharisees. He'd say, Paul, do you have plenty to eat? Yeah, Dad, I have plenty to eat. He says, do you have a roof over your head? Yeah, I have a roof over my head, Dad. Do you have enough clothes to wear? You have enough clothes to wear. He says, well, you're really blessed. And then he said, on top of it, you have your faith and forgiveness of sins. How wise my father was. Well, Jesus moves the story about the rich man and Lazarus forward. Lazarus died, and what did he have? He did have the angels carry him to Abraham's side. The rich man died, but he did not have the same outcome as Lazarus. Nor would the rich young man in our gospel text today unless he confessed his sins and truly believed. Lazarus did have people to bury him. He did have a place in... Um, excuse me, the rich man had people to bury him, and he had a place, he had a place in Hades, what we call hell. He did have torment, and he did have eyes as well to see Abraham afar off and Lazarus. And I like to use this story because it gives us some good depth into the theology concerning the rich and the poor. The rich man in hell wants Abraham to send Lazarus to relieve the anguish of the flame. But Abraham says, no, no, I can't do it. Can't go back and forth. He says, there's a big chasm between you and me, and we can't cross over it. Now, the story could have ended there at the great chasm, but the rich man presses on saying, I beg of you, he says, I beg of you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and I don't want them to end up in the same place that I'm in. And then Abraham said this, he said, they have Moses, they have the prophets, let them hear them. And there's the heart of the story all along. Jesus is telling about having God's word. That's what both of these parables are about. The five brothers have God's word and must become hearers of that word. But sadly, they haven't been hearing it. You, on the other hand, have God's word, both the Old Testament, including the law, that shows us how desperately the ancients and we needed God to send us a Savior. And the good news from the New Testament, the kingdom, the gospel that the Savior has come. And you know that God loves you. You have God's word in Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, for you to hear regularly each Sunday because our pastors preach both the Old and the New Testament. You have the good word in God's news of Jesus suffering death and resurrection for your salvation. You have God's word in the cross, the reminder of your salvation. You have God's word in the bread and wine that were given for forgiveness, life, and salvation in the Lord's Supper. You have God's word hearing it in worship and studying it in Bible class. 
You have it. People, you are the haves. First Timothy 6.6 6 says this, but godliness with contentment is great, great gain. You are like the people who heard the shepherd's words as they returned from seeing the baby Jesus. Those people wondered at the words from Luke chapter 2. You too can be amazed and astonished when you hear the good news of salvation. Mary quietly treasured these things, we're told. You too can treasure up your memory, the good news of the kingdom of God. Mary pondered the words in her heart. You too can draw conclusions about the good news. You can get God's word together with your life. Your heart is the good soil in the parable of the sower. When the word of God is sown in your heart, you are firmly planted with those believers who hold it fast and bear fruit with patience. Jesus says to you also, blessed, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You have, you have God's word. You have air to breathe. We have a gospel message to spread and you have eternal life. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.